that's told. Then this proposition says that there is a unique wealth, not at all surprising, there's a unique wealth threshold Y star above which A star is satisfied. And this time, the jump is upwards. Okay? So optimally chosen wealth for the next generation is non-decreasing in current wealth. Uh, it's, it's sort of, uh, a, a, as, as Y goes up, the, while you're still in the frustration zone, uh, your investment still goes up with your lifetime income. And then there comes a point where, remember, you're solving these two first order conditions, one on the left, one on the right. There comes a point where you say, aha, the first order condition on the right is the one that I like better by single crossing argument. It's just a single crossing argument, right? For those of you who do mechanism design. And then you just go from the left to the right, you jump, and uh, the, the investment level jumps up. Uh, of course, the utility level uh, moves continuously, right? And then, uh, um, and then you have, then you're in the satisfaction zone. Okay. So this part of it is very easy. But what I really want to do is I'm interested in situations of economic growth. So I want to say a word about what happens to rates of growth when you change uh, underlying wealth. And for this, I want to put in so I want to put in a little bit more structure on the problem. I now want to think of uh, models that allow for economic growth. Okay, so uh, what about the growth rate as a function of wealth? So I want to introduce what I'll call the canonical linear model. It's called the canonical linear model because every macroeconomist uses it, right? It's a typical AK model, right? So what does it look like? Well, it has a linear production function. So f of k is equal to rho times k, where rho is the rate of return on, on capital, right? And it has constant elasticity utility, okay? So I put in constant elasticity utility for each of the indicators. So there may be a whole bunch of indicators. Delta is like a discount factor. The pi i's are like weights on the successive uh, aspirational utility. And there's, the, uh, there's a constant elasticity term on top of that. So now what do I do? Well, it's nothing different. It's the sa same problem. It's just a special case. But let's just review it for a second just to see what it looks like. Okay? So what happens with single step aspirations? Just do single step. This is the consumption of the parent today and she gets some utility, the usual utility, right? Then here's the intrinsic utility she gets from the child, right? Z to the power one minus sigma. And then uh, this is the additional utility kick that she gets if she manages to put the child above the aspiration threshold, which I'm calling A over here, right? So now notice that in this canonical linear model, what's nice about this model is that Actually, Y itself doesn't matter. All that matters is Y relative to the aspiration. And the reason you can see that you can do that by just divide through over there by y, right? So uh, if, you do, if you divide through by y, you see you get z, of z divided by y there, z divided by y there. So everything gets expressed in ratios, right? And uh, so you get, you know, you, it's like the parent choosing the growth rate instead of the investment in the child. So now I've set it up so that parents are choosing growth, the, the growth rate of their, of, of their incomes, right? What else is there to say? Nothing much except that you check two first order conditions, one to the left, one to the right, exactly the same story, okay? So if you, you have a failed aspiration, then because, because this is just a standard linear model, you'll have, the, you'll have a growth rate which is just independent of your aspiration level. It may be positive or negative. You may be decaying or increasing, right? And that's the failed aspiration. Or you hit the good first order condition. If you hit the good first order condition, then you'll have a growth rate, of course, that depends on the ratio of your income to the aspirational level, okay? So that's what I'm calling R. R is the ratio of your income to the going aspirational level, and then the growth rate is going to be sensitive to that. Now let's think about it. How is it going to be, before I draw any diagram, let's just think about how it's going to be sensitive. So imagine varying the um, uh, R on the x-axis, okay? So increasing the ratio of parental wealth to aspirations, okay? So at a very low value of R, the parent can't hit the aspiration, okay? And as a result, it's just choosing an insensitive growth rate. So the growth rate will be flat, right? And then there comes a point, the, this aha moment, right, when the parent can move into the high uh, growth rate zone. And when the parent moves into the high growth rate zone, the growth rate is suddenly going to jump up, right? And in fact, in terms of rates, the highest uh, effect is going to be around the point where the parent jumps up. And then as the parent becomes even wealthier, 
Okay, of course, the parent still chooses the high aspiration outcome, but the growth rate will come down because of the concavity effect of the utility function, right? It's not going to have that much of an effect. So what you expect is the growth rate is going to be flat, then it's going to jump, okay? And then it's going to slowly come back down again, okay? So, uh, so of course, not surprisingly, that's exactly what you get. You fix a single milestone in the canonical linear model, then there is a unique value of parental wealth can you guys still hear me at the back? Is that okay? Okay. There's a unique value of parental wealth such that if you're lower than that value, wealth grows at this rate G lower bar, which is just flat, right? And above that, it grows at a rate which depends on the ratio of your income to aspirations, right? And G of, G of this R, okay, or what I'm calling Y over A, it declines in Y, okay? So as I said, the growth rate jumps and then the growth rate starts to fall again, right? But it's always larger and it's bounded away from G lower bar. So even as your wealth goes to infinity, your growth rate doesn't come back to G lower bar. Okay? It stays higher than G lower bar. Okay? So it's larger and bounded away from G lower bar. So the diagram looks a little bit like this. Okay? So in the frustration zone, you have this low growth rate. And then it jumps. And then the growth rate comes back down again to a limit which is strictly higher than the G lower bar point. So how do we do the multi-step case? Well, as you might imagine, no surprises, nothing to write home about. You check all the first order conditions, n of them, with respect to growth rates, and then choose the one you like the best. Okay? And when you do that, you're going to get, again, these jumping up and then coming down of growth, jumping up and coming down of growth. <laughs> and you can put in maybe many aspirations, if you like, I mean, depending on the application that you're interested in. And then all of that is going to get smoothed out, right? But I'm just looking at a case where there's a finite number of them, right? And so uh, what will the result look like? Well, people who are globally frustrated, what do I mean by globally frustrated? That they don't meet any of these aspirational levels. They're going to have a growth rate of G lower bar, right? And then for two individuals with the same non-empty set of satisfied aspirations, the richer individual will have a lower growth rate. It'll look like the solo model, right, uh, with concavity. But if you have uh, uh, people moving from one aspiration level to another, then the growth rate jumps up again. Okay? So the growth rate is going to have this sawtooth pattern where it starts flat and then goes up, comes down, goes up, comes down, goes up, and comes down, right? Uh, so in summary, uh, if you actually had data, which we do, and uh, this is something I, uh, I can't talk to you about today because we haven't done enough work on it. If you look at the growth incidence curve, by a growth incidence curve, it means you look at the different percentiles of wealth and look at the rate at which they grow, it could be quite complex, right, with rising and falling segments uh, or, of different kinds. So the overall tendency, of course, is still for the growth rate to rise in wealth simply because each decline, as I pointed out before, is bounded below by a rate that exceeds the lower bound of the previous one. Okay? So, it, it's, so, it, so it looks a little bit like this, right? There's this frustration at G lower bar, then it jumps up and starts coming down. It's a horrible diagram, but, but you get, you get jumps up and starts coming down, and then jumps up again and starts coming down, and then each bound is kind of higher than the previous lower bound. Okay, okay. so good. I'll, I'll, I'll hope to get done in time. So that brings me to the question of general equilibrium, right? So now I want to take all these pieces, right? and put them together and see whether we can solve the whole equilibrium problem and see what it looks like. Yeah? <coughs> so the joint evolution of aspirations and income. Okay. So let's re recall our recursive uh, definition. We start with Ft. We have aspirations at date t. Everybody chooses wealth, right? Uh, they choose a continuation wealth z. z is tomorrow's wealth. Ft plus 1 is the new distribution. Uh, from F0, we recursively generate Ft. I've just put this slide down before, right? It's the same slide, okay? And you get, uh, you, you get an equilibrium, okay? So what kind of questions can we ask of this model, right? So we can ask, for example, is there persistent and growing inequality in these models? Or is there convergence, right? What is the connection between initial distribution and subsequent growth? The questions don't change. It's the same questions, right? Uh, but we're just asking them from this perspective. Yeah? You guys have all seen these questions before. Okay, so a natural point at which everybody starts, and so do we, right, is to look at the question of steady states, right? So what's a steady state? Well, it's a distribution F star 
which has the property that it replicates itself every period. Yeah? Starting from f star, you get f star every period. What's a good model in which to look at steady states? Everybody knows the answer. It's the solo model, right? So let's look at the solo model. What's the solo model? Well, it's a production function that starts above the 45 degree line and goes below the 45 degree line, right? It's a concave. It, you don't have to assume it's concave for, for in what I do, but think of a concave typical production function. Okay, so we can analyze steady states in this. Okay. So uh, the first proposition is uh, so there exists a steady state distribution. Okay. But the second is that in no steady state can you have equality of wealth. Okay? All, steady states always have to have inequality in these models. Okay? You get, now I don't know about the transition dynamics, but even if you start with perfectly equal wealth, it has to become, it has to bifurcate and become unequal over time. Okay, okay. so not a proof, but just, just trying to give you an idea of how it works. So how does it work? Well, Imagine there's perfect equality, or the, the, the distribution is very concentrated, by the assumption that the aspirations lie in the support of the distribution. I'm making everything open and transparent to you. Remember, the, the aspirations are bounded below by the lowest income and above by the highest income. That means the aspirations and the incomes are squeezed up very close together, so that everybody's at the kink on that utility function. But you can't stay on the kink, right? You look at a first order condition to the left of you or to a first order condition on the right of you and people will shoot away from that kink. So you cannot have a, a, a steady state where people are collapsing onto the kink. The, 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 the fact that there are these two utility functions tends to separate uh, people. Right? And this is kind of related to another area in which Dilip Mukherjee and I have worked on. Uh, Arthur Robson and I have worked on another context, Kiminori Matsuyama, Scott Freeman, a lot of people have worked on this idea of symmetry breaking in equilibrium, right? That you may not be able to have, I've talked about it here, in fact, a couple of years ago, uh, that, that, that you may not be able to have equal distributions in equilibrium. But this is coming from another perspective. Okay, so a steady state must have equality, uh, must have inequality, but also it doesn't have dispersed inequality, but well, it turns out that it actually gets, you get local clusters. Yes, Conor? Uh, so just about that, the last thing. Sure. If you had a more, tip, uh, that a tip, one of those typical reference dependent utility functions with loss aversion, right. then you would get a very different result here, right? Because you could cluster at the point. Yeah, so it would depend on the, the local amount of convexity that's going on right. around. So if that thing is very flat, if the whole problem is almost concave, then you could cluster at that point. Another way you can cluster corner, and I'm going to talk about that, is when you have ongoing growth. Because then everybody is going, jumping up, jumping up, and then you could have <laughs> equality. So I'm going to come back to that issue. So I'm not trying to suggest that you'll never have equality. You'll, you, 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 you can. Yeah, good point. Okay. okay. So steady state must have inequality, but it has local clusters. Let me just say very quickly the result here. It's not, not, not I, I don't want to uh, hold you up for too long. <coughs> Five minutes. So there's 10 minutes left. Okay. Done. Five minutes it is. Uh, so uh, the result, so, so I make the assumption that the standard model without uh, any aspirations at all has a unique steady state, okay, just the usual convergence argument. And then the proposition is written at the bottom, which says that every steady state consists of at least two and at most n plus one mass points where n is the number of aspirations. Okay? Uh, so in particular, the single step aspirational case has to give you bimodal steady states. Okay? You get convergence below and convergence above. Uh, Here's a simulation of it with some stochastic shocks thrown in, just to give you an idea. So you get a kind of bimodal steady state. This is a numerical simulation of the model. Right? Uh, so just like in the solo model, it's an analog of the solo model extended to stochastic case, which was done by Brock and Merman, where you get a sort of single hump distribution. Here's the analog of that, the solo model, but done for stochastic shocks using aspirations. And then you get this sort of smooth uh, 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 bimodal distribution. And uh, I don't have time to talk about this, but there's a, there's, there's a, there's a lot of stuff on uh, multimodality in the, in the economic growth literature. So Danny Kuo, in fact, has a paper where I think the term Twin Peaks appears in the title of the paper, 
or or, may, or maybe in one of the diagrams and so forth. So, and uh, as you, some of you guys might know, I've been interested in bimodality for a long time because of my interest in polarized distribution. So it's uh, sort of some of those some of those thoughts tie together. Okay. So um, I, I, I'm. I have a couple of more results to show you, but since I'm going to be out of time, let me let me try to focus on one of them. And so I want to talk about uh, how uh, uh, endogenous growth works when you have aspirations. And I'm going to come back to Corno's uh, question here as well. Okay, so we are back to the canonical linear model. Okay, so now no, no longer the solo model. So we are, don't have steady states now. Or we can have steady states, but we can have balanced growth, right? We can have ongoing growth. So um, let's think about single step aspirations. Okay, so uh, we are going to do the growth model with single step aspirations. And here is an uninteresting case that I want to throw out immediately. And this is the case where it could happen, right? This, this is the case where everybody is frustrated at date zero. Okay, everybody is frustrated at date zero. In that case, uh, everybody will choose G lower bar. You can prove that G lower bar actually has to be has to involve decay. The growth rate has to be negative in this case. And then by linear homogeneity, right, everybody's aspirations are going to come down by the same amount. And then the story just repeats itself, right? So you're just going to get this, this economy vanishing uh, over time. So for the sake of this talk, let it vanish, okay? So we're not interested in that case, okay? So we don't consider this case. And now I want to sh show you this result, which I think is an interesting contrast to the steady state result, okay, which is the following. So uh, assume that not everybody is frustrated at day zero, which is the case we just disposed of, right? Then there are only two possibilities, okay? The first possibility is that the economy completely converges to perfect equality, okay? That is, there exists a growth rate G star, G star minus one is the growth rate, right? G star is bigger than one, such that everybody's incomes divided by g star to the power t, right, converges to a single point independent of initial conditions, okay? So Kondo, coming back to your point, you can get growth and equality coexisting. So this is one possibility. Or you have to have rising relative inequality forever, okay? It cannot converge to constant inequality. So the system either goes to perfect equality or it has to have inequality that's always growing in the style of Piketty and Atkinson and that sort of stuff, right? Constant ongoing inequality. So uh, FT, the distribution, separates into two components defined by a particular threshold. And the lower component, the people are frustrated they grow at G lower bar. In the upper component, they have an asymptotic growth. If you go back to that comparative statics result I told you about how G jumps up, but then its lower bound is always higher than G lower bar. Using that idea, you can show that the growth rate of the satisfied guys has to be asymptotically higher than the growth rate of the unsatisfied guys. So the inequality has to keep rising. So relative inequality never settles, it perpetually widens. Can I take two more minutes? So? by intimidation. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make a, in any case, there's a, dis so this significantly narrows the ways in which a distribution can evolve. Uh, I just wanted to make the point that case one happens when the, dis when the initial distribution is tight enough. When you have high enough initial equality, you can make it to complete equality. Okay? But if the initial distribution is wide enough, then all hell breaks loose, okay? Then inequality starts going up constantly over time. Okay? So there's this interesting bifurcation that you get depending on initial conditions. So this result is a little different from the standard results that you've probably seen, like Galor Zera or Banerjee Newman, where you get equality or you get some unequal outcome, right? Here you get equality or you get perpetually widening inequality, right? Okay. Uh, let me go on and make one more point about, with, so with multi-step aspirations, this result is more complicated. And frankly, we don't understand the full result uh, ourselves, but many cases are possible. But one case that goes through is that if some individuals are globally frustrated at date zero, okay, with respect to every aspiration, then you again recover the forever widening inequality result. 
So that result stays. But then there are all sorts of interesting special cases that we worked out, and I don't know the answer to all of them. Let me just show you uh, an example with two, two aspirational steps. So this is an example with two aspirational steps and, uh, and, and three income groups. Okay? And then you can get cases like this. For example, this is, a, this is log linearized. This is a case in which the poorest group growth rate is negative, they decay. Then there's a median group that grows at a slow rate. Then there is a high income group that grows at a higher rate. So this is like the Piketty uh, uh, Atkinson kind of results, right? So the asymptotic growth rates are different. Or you can get full convergence, but the full convergence happens, and this is why we can't do it analytically, uh, in a very strange way. People cross over aspirations. Uh, you can see, all, but then ultimately they all come in into the, into the same asymptotics. Or you can get partial convergence. The poorest catch up to the median, and the richest grow faster. Or you can get stable uh, uh, inequality even in this, in, in this case. Right? Uh, uh, here's a case where the rich and the poor all grow at the same asymptotic rate, but they don't converge. So you get all sorts of rich behavior. You don't, you know, anyway, we haven't had time to work on all of that. Then there are extensions we are working on to collective. You can actually take these models and apply them to collective action. Um, then there's stuff we are working on, on on polarization in these societies, and we are even trying to calibrate growth uh, growth uh, incidence curves. So let me summarize because I've really abused uh, Soam's uh, politeness here. Uh, we the idea is that we build a theory of aspirations formation. We emphasize the social foundations of individual aspirations. And we relate those aspirations to investment and growth. And then we aggregate that behavior and close the model. Right? The central feature is that aspirations can both incentivize and frustrate. Aspirations above incomes can encourage high investment. But aspirations that are too high will discourage investment. So rising aspirations have instrumental value, but up to a point. Okay. Uh, Steady state distributions must exhibit inequality. They must have a small number of local attractors. The steady states are bipolar when they're single step aspirations. And finally, the canonical linear model permits sustained growth. And you get an interesting contrast with steady states. You either get convergence to perfect equality or perennially widening inequality in the single step case. With multi step aspirations, there's a finer range of predictions. Okay. So, we believe that this model is tractable, and it may be useful in other contexts. But that depends on all of us to try to figure out. Okay? So I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs> is the other room? Um, so maybe we should uh, take questions from the other rooms first, since you guys have already had your turn. Um, and they haven't. Where will the other rooms speak from? From the other rooms, I presume. <laughs> <laughs> and there'll be a disembodied. <laughs> the room 13. Would you like to ask any questions? Would you like to solve this problem? <laughs> <laughs> room 14. Uh, no questions from room 14. All right. No so okay. Rooms 13 and 14 have uh, been <laughs> fallen asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Frustrated. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so I was wondering if you have thought about if you have thought about uh, extending this model to risky investments, and the reason I asked this specifically is because one of the th uh, from a uh, decision theory perspective, one of the things that has emerged in the social preferences literature is that when you have risk in the environment with social preference, it's not a simple case of extending uh, certainty preferences to expected utility preferences, in I the see. sense that. Uh, in, in those uh, cases, you might have non-consequentialist preferences. So in your model, that would perhaps translate it to statements of the following nature, that I'm a parent and I have to make a risky investment, right? right? And so it could have a good outcome and a bad outcome. If the bad outcome uh, emerges, I can rationalize that investment by saying, that, well, um, the bad outcome did emerge, but I at least gave my child a chance. Right, which would make the, the entire model non-consequentialist. So I was right. wondering if you had thought about kind of. No, I haven't, and these are very interesting points, and it may be worth taking a model like this to a more behavioral decision theoretic context with uncertainty. Right, um, thinking about notions of at least I tried, at least I felt. Yeah, no, that would be very interesting to do. Thanks. Yes, Moshe. 
Uh, so in your model, why are aspiration always in terms of children income rather than your consumption yourself? So I have, you know, there can be a tension between the two, right? That's exactly right. So, uh, so for example, um, in my paper with Arthur Robeson on status, we, we actually write down a model in which people care about their own status today and they also care about their status tomorrow. Right? So, yeah, exactly. So one, one, can, one can do that. We, one can do the same thing here. Okay? So it, it depends on, so the way we were thinking about aspirations is not in consumption space but in wealth space. Okay? Your wealth is given. So you might have aspirations over that and that might give you an extra utility kick but in this it wouldn't make a difference. Right? So it's really all you can do is influence what's going to happen to the next generation. Now I recognize that this is an answer only given in the context of this model. Right? In a more, more general model, you may be able to influence your wealth over your lifetime and then bequest. Right? But as soon as you start going to a multi-period setting, then you can almost start thinking of this model as being applicable again because you just think of your children as, as the next generation, uh, as, as yourself tomorrow. Except then of course the utility function has to be altered, right? Because the utility function should then be the sum of all the... So there are things which have to be done. I'm not, it's not that we didn't, we didn't do them because we thought it's impossible, but we just thought this is the simplest way of making these points. There was a question, yeah. Yeah, very interesting talk. Uh, I'm just wondering whether you have thought about a socially optimal aspiration and, uh, and the first question and second, what is the role of the credit market here. I presume there is no right. credit market at all. Is there? A, can the credit market mitigate this right. kind of? Thing? So let's let's get rid of the relatively more uninteresting question. Not that it's unimportant, but the, the, yeah, the, the, this is just a standard optimal growth setting, right? Those, uh, there's no credit market. You're investing out of your own. Well, I'm, I'm not saying it's an important. Uh, it's an unimportant question, but the far more interesting question in this particular uh, setting is what is the welfare economics of aspirations, right? Now this you know, is something that the more you think about, the more it drives you crazy, right? So if you go to my web page, actually I have a set of notes called Hedonic Altruism and Welfare Economics. So let me, so can I take a minute since room 13 and 14? Yeah, of course. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, so here's, the, here's the point. Imagine that um, you have a society which consists of Ramsey individuals maximizing uh, the utility of their own consumption and the value function, just like the Bellman equation, the value function of their children. Okay, so they get altruism, they get utility out of their children's utility. Okay. Now, in that society, um, a child's utility is entering my utility, right? So imagine a planner in that society who is seeking to maximize the sum of everybody's utilities. <coughs> Now notice that when the planner maximizes my utility, I've already incorporated the child's utility in my preferences. So the planner counts the child once. But then the planner also maximizes the child's utility. So the planner counts the child twice. Okay? So the planner counts the parent once, the child twice, the grandchildren three times, and so on. Right? So it turns out that the social welfare function in a standard Ramsey model is very different from the utility functions of any one of the parents, even though they all have the same utility function. Okay. Now, these sorts of considerations start applying here. So you care about your children. Okay. Uh, um, a planner who cares both about you and your children will count your children twice. Once because they, they give you happiness, and twice because the planner cares intrinsically about the utility of the children. So in these models, there is always underinvestment in your children. And now when you put in aspirations, it's complicated because as soon as you start putting aspirations, you're putting the parents under pressure. They don't like it, right? And who knows what, how to define even utility functions that change in this way, right? But you put the parents under pressure. But they, if they inspire the parents, the children are going to be better off. And that's going to increase social welfare, right? So the welfare economics of aspirations, I'm sorry I'm asked, taking a long time to answer this question, but it's a very important question. I don't know the entire way to do it, but there's lots of these sorts of issues that come into play okay. that I don't particularly know how to model. Uh, hello. Hello, um, excuse I me. I think that... Uh, We're done? Yeah, we are, we are out of time. So Sorry, we have a question from room 30. Where? Is there a question from one of the other rooms? 
Yes, uh, I'm from Room 13. Um, just uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, keep uh, going. Yeah, just um, I wondered that uh, how, for example, that is it uh, this kind of frustration? Does that come from alone uh, the um, from only the uh, inequality from income, or for example, that if I if I am wealthy enough, but for example, I feel that the other people they are. Uh, they are ignoring me because actually my status, my uh, my position status in my job or something like that is lower from the other. So the sure. ignorance I receive from others. So this kind of austerity or something like that. Sure. How actually that can drive